All right, students, thanks for tuning in. Let's take a look at the ideas of assignment 10.2. These slides will help you understand automobile efficiency and major sources of renewable energy. And you can see the list there. Automobile fuel efficiency, meaning miles per gallon, rose after the oil shocks of the 1970s. And by shocks, we mean the oil prices really shot up, but then they became stagnant for decades. So you can see here, throughout the late 70s, fuel efficiency really was increasing tremendously for cars, trucks, and um, both cars and trucks. And then it really did stay stagnant. Uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, we had the boom of the SUV era, um, which really continues to this day. But now we do have definitely more choices as far as hybrid cars and whatnot go. So here's a question. The maximum possible efficiency of cars is closest to, which one do you think? If you said 30%, that's correct. Let's take a look at what happens to all that chemical potential energy of the gasoline. Of all the gasoline we're putting in, 62% of it is lost in the form of engine heat loss. And this is due to the second law of thermodynamics. There's just no way that you can get the molecules of the expanding gases to push on the piston without also heating up the entire engine block. And um, so, that's um, when you just look at that number right there, you would say the maximum possible efficiency for a car would be 38%, which is 100 minus 62. But then you have to throw in other things, um, other ways that cars waste energy. For example, when they're idling, just sitting there running without actually moving, approximately 17% loss due to that. Drivetrain friction, so that would be like the friction of the gears. And then you have the running accessories like the water pump, which circulates the cooling fluid air conditioning, stereo, etc. With good engineering, we can take care of these ones in purple, but there's no way we can do anything about the ones in red. Um, okay, so let's go to this idea of the corporate average fuel economy standards. You should be able to recognize this if you were to see it, see it like on an AP um, multiple choice question, most likely. The main idea is that um, car companies came together to uh, set new standards for improving fuel economy standards with each year. So right now we're at model year 2015. You can buy those on the market now. And it's saying that if you have a small car, so it has a less than a 45 square foot foot base um, or wheelbase, you should be getting 50 miles per gallon. And we see that now as we have hybrid vehicles. Public transportation is another great way to save gasoline. And you can see here that they also put out a lot fewer pollutants. Um, carbon monoxide is 90% lower for buses and other public transportation vehicles than for individual cars. Same thing with VOCs, uh, almost 90% lower. What's the deal with that? Probably catalytic converters. That those cars, those buses that are on the road are all pretty much newer. So they have good, well-running emissions controls, especially good catalytic converters. When you have private vehicles, you know, you might have somebody driving around their 1980 car or 1990s car, which really does not have very good emissions control. But you will rarely see a bus that old on the road. Uh, and then as far as CO2 emissions, that's about half. And, you know, basically when you pack more people onto a vehicle, you, um, you're dealing with a little bit more um, air resistance because it's a bus, not a car but relative to the number of people on it, it's much, um, much more efficient. Or if you think about like a train, which is also public transporta transportation, um, only the first train car experiences that wind resistance. All the other cars are drafting off of it. Okay, so let's take a look at renewable energy. Here's a list. Maybe the ones that you're not as familiar with would be biomass, which is burning plant material, and uh, geothermal, getting heat from the from the heat of the earth, um, from the magma. So in Southern California, the least commonly used renewable source for electricity is, which one do you think? So if you said solar, that was correct. Most people think of solar as pretty common because we see it. But this is the 2002, um, it's called the power content label for Southern California Edison. Sorry if that was a little blurry. But we can see here that solar was only 1% of their mix. Wind is much bigger, 8%. Geothermal, 9%. Biomass, pretty small, 1%. Um, we can see here that in Southern California, we don't use much coal. We do use some large hydroelectric. 
um, probably Hoover Dam with that one. And uh, natural gas, definitely big. And a little bit of nuclear in there too. And um, and then unspecified sources. I'm looking at, these should all add up to 100%. I've never seen unspecified sources of power before. I look at this content label pretty much each year, but that's kind of a new one for me. I don't know what the deal is. All right, so one thing we can look at is renewable energy subsidies. So we saw the graph on the right in one of the earlier 10.1 um, uh, slides, but let's take a look at subsidies. This is government money going to support these, re these um, fuel energy sources. Lots of money going into wind development. That's awesome. Coal, uh, nuclear gets a lot of subsidizing because it's actually pretty expensive to mine the uranium and process it. Coal, a little bit. Solar, a little bit. Natural gas, a little bit, etc. So the idea of subsidy is the government's giving money to those industries to help promote them. And we can see that as a result, wind has grown more than any of the other types of renewable energies. Let's take a look at hydroelectric. So pretty simple idea. Moving water is used to turn turbines to generate electricity. And of course, there's always the risk of the flood where if the um, dam were to break, you would have major flooding downstream. And uh, these are really good for nations with large amounts of flowing water. Brazil uses this heavily. They're the biggest users in the world. And 98% um, of the U.S. rivers are currently dammed for hydroelectric. That's, that's big. We should understand that um, uh, Canada and China, they both um, get a large part of their electricity from hydropower. You can see Canada gets over half. China is the biggest overall user, but they're a huge country. Um, I'm sorry, they're the second biggest user, but they have, of course, the big um, Three Gorges Dam. Brazil gets 83.8% of their electricity from hydropower in wild Norway, 98.9, didn't know that one. So here's a little diagram showing the basic idea. Intake coming in here, the water turns the turbine, which turns a generator inside of the powerhouse. And um, one thing that we should be aware of is that a big problem with dams is the water flows through, but because the water's been sitting for a while, the sediment that it's carrying settles. And so over time, behind every dam, you have accumulation of silt and that lowers the capacity of the reservoir. Every once in a while, they need to go in and try to dredge it out, get that silt out, but that's extremely expensive. So that's another problem with hydroelectric dam. It captures sediment, which would normally go downstream to help, um, to help restore beaches where it eventually ends up in the ocean and to restore um, agricultural lands when, when there's flooding. All right, so you can take a look at some of the pros and cons of hydroelectric power. You've already included some of these, hopefully, in your concept, I mean, in your assignment 10.2. But um, you can take a look at those. And biomass is the organic substances produced by recent photosynthesis, unlike fossil fuels, which are products of ancient photosynthesis. Here you can see a list of some different ones here. Wood cut from trees, charcoal, manure from domestic animals. They burn cow dung in places like India. And you can burn crop residue like corn stalks, which are not edible. And um, even forestry residues, wood waste from logging. This is all examples of biomass. Oh yeah, components of municipal solid waste. We saw that when we studied incinerators. More than one billion people burn fuel wood or charcoal as their principal power source for cooking, heating, etc. And a lot of those people do it indoors, so they suffer from that indoor air pollution. And um, we are now also taking some of that biomass and converting it into biofuels by having microorganisms digest that and produce alcohol as a result. So ethanol is alcohol produced by fermenting corn and other carbohydrate rich crops and is added to gasoline to reduce automotive emissions. When you buy gas in California, about 10% of it is ethanol. And automakers are producing flexible fuel vehicles that can run on 85% ethanol and 15% gasoline. Biodiesel is another thing you can do. You can, um, this is produced from vegetable oil, and such as used cooking grease or animal fat. And it's used in cars with diesel engines. And it cuts down on emissions compared with petro or oil and diesel. And so you can see a big difference here. This is biodiesel, 100% uh, biodiesel, and then 20% biodiesel we can see a, um, an absence of sulfates 
because cooking oil or plant oil does not contain sulfates and that's awesome and i've even heard that if you use you know grease fryers i think there's a teacher over at la cumbra um mr something it was like a german name he built a diesel car uh, a biodiesel car and they would run it on vegetable oil from like local fast food restaurants and it would the exhaust would smell like french fries so here's some pros and cons of biomass you can read through these and kind of see which ones resonate with you and um, and be familiar with those ones but one thing that I can point out here that is that biomass releases no net carbon into the atmosphere. When you burn it, yes, it does release CO2, but that's CO2 that was taken out of the atmosphere when it was growing, when it was doing photosynthesis. Um, and we should also mention, though, around here, that farming corn and other biofuel inputs requires fossil fuels and industrialized agriculture. So you have to actually put a lot of energy into the intensive agriculture used to grow the corn. Um, in order to have enough to make a significant amount of biofuel. All right, let's take a look at solar. So as you know, solar generates electricity. It's called the photoelectric effect. These are called photovoltaic cells. And solar collectors are different. They use solar energy to heat water. They can be 100% efficient at converting sunlight to heat. And here we see a passive system that requires no pumps or other moving parts, so it's very reliable. It doesn't break. Um, and um, as opposed to something that's an active system, in this case here we have all, all these mirrors and they are reflecting sunlight to this thing in the middle up here at the top and all that focused sunlight heats up water which turns a generator. So because these mirrors rotate constantly to focus it, they're called active um, solar collectors and of course that means some of their little motors might break and things like that. So that's the big downfall with them. And by solar energy, uh, we should just point out that each day the Earth receives enough sunlight to power human consumption for 27 years if we could somehow capture it all. And it's not really a new, t a new idea. The first thermal solar collector was, um, I guess, documented in 1767. And the first commercial solar water heaters were 1890. And um, we should recognize that it is fast growing. You, we see more and more places in town with photovoltaic, photovo, uh, photovoltaics on the roof, growing at 33% per year. Uh, cheaper technologies are taking off in developing countries. So solar water heaters are much um, more simple and cheaper than solar electric, which requires batteries and sophisticated semiconductor um, and things like that. And um, solar cookers, those are also really cool. So here's some summary of some pros and cons. And I guess the big thing is the con is that you have a big upfront investment because those systems cost tens of thousands of dollars. And of course, it depends where you live. In Southern California or in general, let's say the Southwest US, we get a lot of sunshine. Let's take a look at wind. So here's a picture of some turbines at a wind farm. And um, you get really good wind conditions. You don't have any mountains or anything like that to block the wind here. And it's pretty simple. They turn, the blades turn the gearbox, which turns the generator to produce electricity. Very much like the generator I showed you in class. And uh, it's the fastest growing power source today. And we can also say here that windmills have been used for centuries. A windmill would literally be for turning, um, you know, uh, wheat plants or something into flour. It's biggest in Europe. You can see Germany's, um, I guess, 37 percent. I mean, what are we saying here? 37 percent of the wind power um, is done by German in Germany. Okay, pros and cons. So. I guess one thing we'll mention here is some people object to aesthetics. That's usually a pretty valid concern in a lot of cases. People don't want things that are ugly. And, um, um, but the pros are, as you can see, it's very renewable. The costs are pretty low after the initial investments and costs are dropping. Definitely cheaper than solar panels. All right, let's take a look at geothermal. It's really big in Iceland where they get 86% of their electricity. 
And basically, in Iceland, you have a very thin crust, so it's really easy to tap into the heat of the Earth. Here's a little diagram of it. So you have a place where you inject water into the Earth, and it's heated by the magma that's very close. And then it comes up as steam, turns into generator, goes to a cooling tower where it's converted back to water, and it repeats the cycle. And ultimately, that heat comes from radioactive decay of elements, um, or actually, we can say, or from magma that's close. But the magma itself is heated from radioactive decay. Here's a list of some pros and cons. And um, one thing we should mention here is that heated water may give out after a while, because tectonic plates, um, things can move or aquifer pressure can drop. Depending on whether water is being taken out, that can affect what's going on under the surface. And um, because you're dealing with a lot of rotating water like that, you can have salts in the water, which can corrode equipment. Um, and uh, yeah, it can be pretty inexpensive in areas where geothermal heating naturally occurs. So Hawaii is a big place for the US. About a quarter of their electricity comes from that. Let's take a look at ocean. So we have tidal power because every day, or twice every day, the high tide occurs. So that means water's coming in and then water going back out. And so that movement of water can be used. And also, of course, wave power. If you can somehow develop a device that the waves make move and as it's moving it can turn a little generator and make electricity here's an example of tidal power it's like it's like a dam and when the uh when the tides come in it holds that water and slowly releases it throughout the day and uh, that is used to power a hydroelectric dam or a generator i mean and here's just an example of wave energy um, not a big deal, they're not, not you know, too fancy here, but incoming waves can move something and that turns a generator. Here's some pros and cons. Of course, I think the biggest one we should focus on is it can interfere with ecology of estuaries and intertidal shorelines. So if you are doing something like this, then you're going to be affecting the estuaries, which is where the, um, the fresh water and the salt water are mixing. So you might end up... Um, affecting the salinity of that area. So the species who are not able to tolerate the change in salinity will move, migrate, or die off. Uh, 